Our world is always moving forwards, continuously creating and producing new innovative products and technologies. But our modern research and developments extend beyond our latest phone model or the newest medicine breakthrough. Some of the most fundamental research we carry out today focuses on unveiling past mysteries and rediscovering the lives of societies who shaped the world as we know it. From ancient societies' traditions and rituals to places we did not know existed, there are many unanswered questions within our history books. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at recent discoveries that have provided us with a glimpse into human history. Massive hole discovered under Antarctica, bigger than the Grand Canyon. Researchers exploring the Ellsworth subglacial highlands, an ancient mountain range buried beneath miles and miles of Antarctic ice, have discovered a pit deeper than the Grand Canyon. The incredible find was discovered by combining data provided by aircraft satellites with ice-penetrating radar technology towed by snowmobiles. Originally an ancient mountain range, now layered over by thousand-year-old glaciers, the massive trench, or rather valley, reaches 1.9 miles deep, 200 miles long, and more than 15.5 miles wide. To put this into perspective, the Grand Canyon is only about one mile deep. Dr. Neil Ross, a geology professor at Newcastle University, describes the find as incredibly serendipitous. As the teams of researchers and scientists had spent three seasons mapping out the subglacial mountain range beforehand, yet had never expected to find this trough. They further went on to explain that while they had been able to gather data from the two ends of the huge hidden valley, they had no previous insight into what lay in between their data points. In the end, the satellite data was used to fill in the gaps, because although covered by several miles of glacial ice, the valley is so vast that it can be seen from space," continued Ross. After analyzing their discovery and supporting data, it has been determined that this valley was formed millions of years ago by a small ice field, much akin to those of the present-day Antarctic Peninsula. A couple of years later, a similar quest found a large hole beneath the barren icy landscapes of Antarctica, in which topography has shown that there may be another huge hole beneath the ice sheet's surface. This hole is not quite as deep as the last, or the Grand Canyon, measuring at only 0.6 miles deep, but it has been found to be longer than the Grand Canyons, making it incredibly significant as well. These sizable discoveries are quite literally in more ways than one, go to show just how much about the Earth we have left to uncover, and that there is still so much we do not know about the planet we call home. This is especially applicable to the Antarctic, one of the largest landmasses on Earth, still pretty much unsurveyed to date. Mysterious Lost City Discovered in the Cambodian Jungle The Cambodian jungle is a place of much intrigue, but the greatest discovery by far was that of the lost city of Mahendra Parvata. Archaeologists utilized laser technology combined with ground surveys to find the lost city placed within the Phnom Kulin Mountains. The researchers involved stated, despite knowing that the Phnom Kulin Mountains likely hid traces of a Khmer capital city, archaeologists have had difficulty accessing the region. The mountains are covered in dense vegetation, and they were one of the last strongholds of Khmer Rouge guerrillas until the 1990s. Landmines and unexploded ordnance continue to pose a threat to communities living and working in the mountains and complicate archaeological research. The LiDAR laser was used for this expedition, which provides researchers with information detailing the distance to the Earth's surface and reveals areas overgrown by nature. LiDAR is an incredibly useful tool, also used for a myriad of other applications, including in vehicles, as it is what allows modern cars to have 360-degree cameras. The lost city of Mahendra Pavata itself was established somewhere between the 8th and 9th century AD and was a part of the long-since-gone Khmer Empire. However, most archaeologists fervently believe that the city of Mahendra Pavata is older than the megacity Angkor, also of the Khmer Empire. LiDAR has shown that there is a hydraulic architectural design in Mahendra Pavata, although it was never completed. 
Researchers claimed this meant that the water management system was not sufficient to support irrigated rice agriculture, which may suggest the city did not last long as a Khmer power center, even though the reservoir at Mahendra Pavata was not functional and may have inspired the vast artificial lakes that would become a defining feature of Angkor. Aside from the lost city itself, researchers went to check out the mound fields surrounding the site. It is an area composed of 366 mounds, all in strange geometric patterns of 15 groups. At the site, archaeologists discovered ceramics and building remnants from the 10th century AD. Although the purpose of the mounds remains unknown, it is likely that, whatever they were, the mounds were built later than the majority of Mahendra Pavata. In a different yet related project to the finding of Mahendra Pavata, scientists found more information that explains why the city of Angkor fell. The study argued that instead of a catastrophic event, as many people tend to assume, the city fell gradually through the course of a certain period of time. The city of Angkor was once the powerhouse of the jungle Khmer Empire, which at one point was believed to house one million people. The fall of Angkor could be related to the fall of Mahendra Pavata and all neighboring cities of the empire. Some researchers believe that Angkor fell due to surrounding states invading or attacking the empire's assets around 1431, and this is currently the leading theory. Tomb of Ramesses II's Treasurer Unearthed To this day, ancient Egypt serves as one of the most thoroughly researched periods of history. Since the earliest discoveries of this great civilization, its popularity has hardly waned. Scientists still study it, students still read about it, and Hollywood still glamorizes it. Both because and despite of its popularity, new discoveries are made all the time. One of the latest of these discoveries includes Ta Umweer, Egyptian pharaoh Ramesses II's head treasurer. Ramesses II reigned from 1279 to 1213 BCE, claiming the second longest reign in Egyptian history. Ramesses II boasts a strong and legendary reputation that includes battles with the Hittites and Libyans, the incorporation of sweeping building programs, and the commissioning of numerous gigantic statues in his honor. Although a fair amount is known about Ramesses II, less seems to be known about his royal team. However, while excavating in Saqqara Necropolis, a team of Cairo University students discovered the tomb of Ta Umwia, Ramesses II's head treasurer, royal scribe, and supervisor of cattle. Ta Umwia also oversaw sacrifices performed at Ramesses II's Theban temple. Ola El Aghizi, the Egyptian language scholar leading the archaeological research, claims that Ta Umwia's tomb has a very distinctive style shared by other tombs at the site. The entrance contains carved scenes that detail and recall events in Ta Umwia's life. Inside, the walls are covered with colorful images and paintings, one of which depicts a sacrificial procession and a calf being given. Assyrian columns, a very popular adornment during Ramesses II's rule, were also discovered at the scene. Assyrian columns are depictions of a standing Osiris, the god of the deceased and resurrection. Some of these columns were covered by the sand, and blocks were scattered all around the tomb. According to al the tomb and all of its parts will be thoroughly studied before being put back into their original places. The Saqqara Necropolis is where archaeologists discovered Ta Umwia's tomb, and was used as a ritual ground for more than three millennia. Although the discovery of Ta Umwia's tomb is clearly noteworthy, the Saqqara Necropolis may provide more information about ancient Egypt and its intimate practices than ever before. In late 2020, archaeologists discovered what they are now calling megatombs of mass sites. They even found a single site with over 100 tombs, the first of its kind discovered in Egypt. The Saqqara Necropolis has been garnering more researchers than ever before, and for good reason. By focusing on previously neglected sites of historical significance, perhaps scientists can help piece together more of the history of ancient Egypt. And by doing so, they can help answer the burning questions that have plagued the public for centuries. 
slice of human brain is kept alive in a petri dish for 12 hours. A huge part of science we all want to advance in great leaps and bounds is, of course, medicine. A breakthrough study has seen scientists successfully keep a piece of human cortex alive in a petri dish for 12 hours, something that has never been done before and marks the potential for significant medical progress. Being able to observe and experiment with a one centimeter slice of human brain could lead to better drugs and treatments for diseases we know to be fatal. Emma Louise Louth, the lead researcher of the project, working at the University of Copenhagen, with the help of her team, was able to take quick action after taking a sample of the patient's cortex, making sure the tissue could survive. These steps involved the regulation of temperature and oxygen, cooling the sample down and making sure it stayed oxygenated, then submerging the tissue sample into a mixture of ions and minerals that was designed to mimic that of cerebral spinal fluid. This all was intended to keep the sample alive ready for observation. In a press release, Louth revealed that this cortex brain sample stayed alive for 12 hours. That is 12 hours of research opportunity we have not had before. This complicated breakthrough has bridged a gap between animal studies to humans. Louth said in her statement, to borrow an analogy from another researcher, mouse studies versus human studies are basically like looking at a Nokia 3310 when trying to repair an iPhone. They have the same basic functions, but there is much greater complexity in the human brain. Animal studies have been a point of contention for years. Animals are simply different to us as humans. While the brain may work in a similar manner, how can we accurately determine that the processes within are the same between a human and a mouse? We already know that there are significant differences between the types of cells and receptors within humans and mice, so being able to use humans helps drastically. Louth and her team were able to look at the dopamine-enhanced connections between neurons in humans and mice. This means that the neurotransmitter we consider engaging with reward strengthens the connection between neurons in the human brain. In short, Louth and her team looked at how dopamine is different in humans than in mice. In practical terms, this has real-life application in terms of testing drugs. If we are able to keep these brain tissues alive long enough to observe effects, we will be able to see how the different species' neurotransmitters react differently to various drugs, meaning we know what will work best for humans, not mice. Of course, when studies begin to work with human brains, there are ethical considerations to be considered. And no, these concerns are not whether it is unethical to plonk humans in mazes and make them run for cheese. Is it okay to cut up, experiment on, and remove bits of a living human brain? Louth has assured the public that no pain is felt, no memories are stored in the tissue, and without all the other parts of the brain being connected together, there is no painful damage being inflicted on the sample. So, if we can perform these studies on emotionless brain samples, why would we continue to work with living animals? The opportunities this study presents in terms of both scientific validity and the ethics and well-being of animals is monumental. Not to mention the realistic difference this could make to medical research. Louth believes this research could help rehabilitation after a stroke or other acute brain damage where synaptic connections are lost. So, what's next for this research? The University of Copenhagen scientists are now aiming to keep the sample alive for longer, with the next milestone being 10 days. It will not be long until this research begins to have a tangible impact upon medicine. Mysterious DNA Results from the Shroud of Turin The Shroud of Turin, also known as the Holy Shroud, is a stretch of linen a little over a meter long. It has a faint, difficult-to-see image of a man on it, showing both a front and back view of the man entirely nude, with the groin being covered by the man's hands. This image is very faint and is hardly even visible when looking at the brown linen. Though the image becomes much clearer when looked at in the photographic negative. What is so important about the shroud? Many believe the man on the linen depicts Jesus Christ, as some reddish-brown stains on the cloth align with the biblical description of Jesus' wounds following his crucifixion. Though the Catholic Church does not offer any formal comments as to whether the shroud is or is not genuine, 
The general belief as to why the Holy Shroud is so important is that Jesus was wrapped in the linen as his burial shroud following his crucifixion. The Shroud of Turin has been kept in the Royal Chapel of the Cathedral of Turin in Italy since 1578. Now, the mystery continues to develop, with a DNA study in 2015 revealing the journey of the Shroud, based on the pollen and dust that it seems to have come into contact with. By sequencing these genes, the team is able to tell what people and what plants the linen has been surrounded by. In a nutshell, it appears as though the Shroud itself was made in India before beginning quite a tour of the world. It journeyed from Jerusalem to Turkey, across to France and down to Italy, where it has remained in Turin. One of the biggest aids in determining all this information was the plants, as some plant groups are native specifically to certain regions. For example, clovers, horsetail, chicory and ryegrass are native exclusively to the Mediterranean, meaning when these pollens were found on the linen, that the shroud must have at least passed through the Mediterranean. Dr. Gianni Barassia, a plant genetics professor at the University of Padova, commented, Here we report the main findings from the analysis of genomic DNA extracted from dust particles vacuumed from the parts of the body image and the lateral edge used for radiocarbon dating. The team found plant genes not only from the Mediterranean, but also some from the Middle East, Asia, or from the Americas, though the researchers have been careful in explaining that some of these genes may have been introduced after the medieval period, not necessarily during. Some of the researchers said that some of the notable crop species identified were grown by farmers and therefore were somewhat common in farming communities and agricultural systems in the Old World, namely chicory, common hop, cucumber and grapevine. But what is the reason for the Shroud to have such excessive travel? Simply put, the current belief is that after being made in India, the Holy Shroud then travelled to be worshipped, with plenty of religious people visiting it as it passed through their countries or regions. Another working theory is that the Shroud of Turin was created in medieval Europe, but did not travel quite so much. With this theory, the presence of such diverse DNA is explained by the Shroud being something of a religious attraction inviting people to come and see it from all around the globe, allowing it to be contaminated by a broad range of DNA. The authenticity of the Holy Shroud has been called into question time and time again. Was it used to bury Jesus Christ? How was the image of the man created? Was it even made in the medieval period? Well, in 1998, the Shroud was carbon dated to the 13th century. But while some questions are answered, we still have a long way to go to truly determine its authenticity and answer our questions about its creation. Whilst the Church offers no comments on the legitimacy of it, having been involved in the burial of Jesus, nor on any involvement of miracles in the man being displayed on the linen, the Shroud of Turin continues to be an item of religious importance. It is exciting to find out more about its history and the advancements in gene sequencing and other scientific methodology developments are what make this possible. But what do you make of these interesting discoveries? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.